Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Natus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our microbiology and infectious diseases playlist. In previous videos, we talked about all the gram-positive cocci that you can imagine. We talked about Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis, Staph saprophyticus. We talked about Streptococcus pyogenes, Streptococcus pneumonia, Streptococcus bovis, Enterococci, Viridens group, etc. Today, we will have a quick review. It's gonna be a blast! If you have watched the previous videos in order, let's review some quick pearls. Endospores are only made by some gram-positive bacteria only. Gram-negatives never make spores. We've learned about different mechanisms by which the bacteria evade your immune system. And the capsule was a big deal, especially when it comes to the Streptococcus pneumoniae capsule. It's the job of your spleen to get rid of these encapsulated organisms. Ergo, if I have a spleen problem, I am vulnerable to infections with encapsulated bacteria. Examples include Streptococcus pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza, or Neisseria meningitidis. Gram-positive cocci are catalase-positive, including Staph, or catalase positive, which are strep. Then we have three staphs, Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis, and Staph saprophyticus. How can I tell the difference? Ask yourself, is it coagulase positive? This is Staph aureus. Coagulase negative? Well, it could be epidermidis or saprophyticus. Therefore, the next question is, is it novobiosin sensitive or resistant? If novobiosin kills it, it's Staph epidermidis. If novobiosin could not kill it, it is Staph saprophyticus. Are you supposed to put novobiosin near your genitalia? No, it's not gonna kill Staph saprophyticus. What if I'm catalase negative? You are streptococcus. And then the next question is, are you alpha hemolytic, beta hemolytic, or gamma hemolytic, meaning no hemolysis? If you're alpha hemolytic, the next question is optoken. Listen, alpha optoken. If you're optoken sensitive, you're streptococcus pneumonia. If you're optoken resistant, you are streptococcus viridans. Optoken and bile will kill streptococcus pneumoniae. That's why it cannot live in your gut. But optoken and bile cannot kill streptococcus viridans. It is resistant to them. What if there is beta hemolysis or complete hemolysis? With a beta hemolysis, look at bacitracin. Bacitracin kills it. It is streptococcus pyogenes. Bacitracin did not kill it, it is Streptococcus agalactic. Are you supposed to put Bacitracin near your genitalia? No, because it does not kill Streptococcus agalactiae. How about if there is no hemolysis or gamma hemolysis? Ask yourself, do they grow in 6.5% salt solution? If they can grow in salt, Enterococcus cannot grow in salt, Streptococcus bovis. Out of these organisms, which ones are PYR positive, which stands for l pyrolidinyl erolamidase F me. The only two that are PYR positive are Streptococcus pyogenes and Enterococci. If you are PYR positive, you will give me a red color. Please recall that Streptococcus viridans, Enterococcus, and Streptococcus gallolyticus all can grow in bile. The gram stain, we have gram positive, purple, or gram negative, pink. Why the difference? It depends on the thickness of the peptidoglycan layer of the cell wall. The cell wall is thicker in the gram positive as compared to the gram negatives. When it comes to the free market, the better the mind, the longer the range. When it comes to the gram stain, the thicker the wall, the purpler the stain. Gram positives have a thicker wall, therefore they appear purple. But gram negatives have thinner wall, that's why you will wash away the purple and they will acquire the pink stain. What's the name of your purple stain? Crystal violet. What's the name of your pink stain? It's called Fossen from Fuchsia, which is my counter stain. Counter to what? To the purple. What's the function of the catalase enzyme to break down the harmful hydrogen peroxide into the harmless oxygen and water to protect the bacteria? Bacteria is smart, protecting itself 
by having catalase enzyme. Now you understand why these organisms are purple and you understand the function of catalase. Can we differentiate between staph and strep by using one drop of a solution? That's it? One drop? Yes, indeed. Just add one drop of hydrogen peroxide containing solution. If the bacteria has catalase, i.e. staph, it will convert your H2O2 into water and oxygen. And oxygen is a gas that will give you bubbles. So if you see bubbles, it is catalase positive, i.e. staph. No bubbles, it is strep. That was the catalase. How about the coagulase? Also important, because staph aureus is coagulase positive, but streptococcus is coagulase negative. How is this clinically relevant? It is very relevant indeed. What's the function of coagulase? To coagulate. And when I coagulate, I will be confined into a certain area, a narrow focus on the human body. I will not spread, as in case of strep. Look at this wonderful staph aureus, coagulase positive. That's why you get folliculitis, tiny dot that is confined. Make it a little bigger, abscess, a collection of pus. Make it bigger, furuncle, an infection of hair follicle. Make it bigger and slightly deeper, carbuncle. Bigger, deeper, but still confined and localized because staph is coagulase positive, it has coagulated itself in a narrow area. Conversely, Streptococcus, which is coagulase negative, will spread like crazy. We're talking sepsis, cellulitis, necrotizing fasciitis, erysipelas, all of these are widespread as compared to staph. Who causes impetigo then? Both of them can lead to impetigo, usually more common with staph, but strep can cause impetigo as well. Here's a wonderful comparison between staph aureus, staph epidermidis, and staph saprophyticus. Pause and review. Let's talk more about staph aureus. Here are the virulence factors of staph aureus. We had structural components, we had toxins and enzymes. To be specific, we had five structural components, four toxins, five enzymes. The most important structural components are the capsule, the slime layer, peptidoglycan, tachoic acid, and protein A, also known as staphylococcal protein A. As for the toxins, we had cytotoxins, exfoliative toxins, which can lead to staph scalded skin syndrome or SSSS. We have the enterotoxins that can lead to watery diarrhea and food poisoning caused by staph, especially after eating contaminated potato salad, ham, banana pudding, ice cream, pastries, etc. And toxic shock syndrome toxin number one, which causes toxic shock syndrome. These diseases are not caused by the staph aureus bacteria. Instead, they are caused by its toxins. So these are intoxications rather than true infections. Big difference. As for the five enzymes, we have the coagulase, hyaluronidase, fibrinolysin, aka staphylokinase. We have lipase and nuclease. The staphylokinase of staph aureus is equivalent to streptokinase of streptococcus pyogenes. Both are fibrinolysin cause lysis of fibrin. But staphylothrombin is unique to staph. Strep does not have one. Conversely, streptolysin or hemolysin, such as streptolysin S and streptolysin O, against which you can make your ASO antibodies, are unique to streptococcus. Staph does not have them. Staph has nucleus to break down your nucleus. Streptococcus has a similar DNAs to break down your DNA which is in your nucleus. How can we diagnose Staph aureus in the lab? We need microscopy and gram stain. We need culture. Staph is very flexible. It can grow on selective or non-selective media, aerobic or anaerobic, at room temperature, very comfortable. The famous yellow golden colonies, that's why we call it aureus, because oreo means gold. And staph aureus can ferment mannitol, that's why we use the mannitol salt agar. Staph can survive 7.5% salt solution. You can use a DNA test, you can use identification biochemical tests, such as the coagulase test, which is the tube coagulase test. If the bacteria is coagulase positive, like staph aureus, you will form a clot. 
you can try to identify protein A, which belongs to staph. And then detection, you can detect the antigen known as tachoic acid because you will make antibodies against the tachoic acid, which is part of the cell wall of the staph aureus. Management of staph aureus was discussed before. Food poisoning, just self-limiting, supportive care. Bullus impetigo is more severe than non-bullus. That's why with bullus, you always go with systemic antibiotics. Non-bullus, it depends. If it's mild, topical. If it's severe, systemic. So severe non-bullus and bullus are treated the same way. Oral syphilax. Abscess, incision, and drainage. And antibiotics include ox, clox, dicloxin, neph, because these are anti-staph. Oxacillin, cloxacillin, dicloxacillin, nephicillin. What if this uh, staph aureus is MRSA? Doxycycline, clindamycin, linizolid, TMP, SMX are available orally. Or, if it's severe, vancomycin, deptomycin, linizolid, tiger cycline, and these are available intravenously. So here is everything about staph aureus disease in one slide. Pause and review. Coming up next, staph epidermidis. Here's the myth. Most students mistakenly believe that since the name is staph epidermidis, it will cause infections in your skin. Not true. This bacteria lives in your skin, colonizes your skin, but does not cause diseases in your skin. It only causes diseases if something cuts your skin and now the bacteria gains access to your blood, causing problems inside your body, such as endocarditis, such as bacteremia, sepsis, etc. What's the name of that incident that introduced them inside my body? Could be trauma, could be surgery, could be catheter, could be intravenous line, could be arterial line, could be shunt, could be graft, etc. Staphylococcus epidermidis lives on your skin. After injury or surgery or arterial line or venous line, it can enter into your blood causing bacteremia and endocarditis, especially if your heart valves are artificial or weakened because of rheumatic fever or congenital heart disease. How do the bacteria attach so well to the catheter? Because it has a polysaccharide slime layer. We call these biofilms. Bio means biological. Film means a layer of bacteria on the catheter, on the tissue. Staph epidermidis can lead to failure of the valve in your heart or failure of your artificial joint. How can we diagnose it? Just like staph aureus, except for the fact that staph epidermidis is coagulase negative. As for treatment, if it is sensitive, ox, clox, dicloxin, and neph, because that's a staph, if it's resistant, go with vanco again. Staph epidermidis is urease positive, novobiosin sensitive. Next, staphylococcus saprophyticus and urinary tract infections. Do not put novobiosin in your genital area because it will not kill staph saprophyticus and will not cure your honeymoon cystitis. Diseases caused by staph saprophyticus are all of the urinary tract infections, starting with urethritis, then go up to the bladder, cystitis, go up to the kidney and the renal pelvis, pyelonephritis. Symptoms of urethritis are frequency, urgency, burning dysuria, and maybe pyuria. Symptoms of cystitis are all of the above, plus suprapubic pain and tenderness and sense of fullness there. Symptoms of pyelonephritis are all of the previous ones, plus fever and flank pain and costovertebral angle tenderness. You can call it costovertebral or costophrenic no one cares. Diagnosis, there is pus in the urine. There are organisms in the urine. These organisms are coagulase negative. Treatment is antibiotics. Pause and review. Next, let's leave the staphs alone and talk about streptococci, starting with streptococcus pyogenes. Virulence factors of streptococcus pyogenes. We have six structural components, the most important of which is the M protein. For taxonomy and classification purposes, we use these carbohydrate that are specific to the group, such as group A, group B, group D, strept, etc. We have one toxin known as erythrogenic toxin. Erythro means red, and it will cause the red scarlet fever, where you have fever and a rash. Here is one example of a super antigen causing a cytokine storm. 
cyto cell kinin from kinetic. It is kinetic to the cell. It moves the cell. It induces the cells to do some crazy stuff. Four enzymes: streptolysin, which is a hemolysin, and you have two of these: streptolysin S and streptolysin O. Streptolysin O is super duper important because you make antibodies against it. When you see your antibodies floating in the blood in a high titer, it means that you probably have a streptococcus infection in your body. And this is called the ASO titer. Streptokinase is a fibrinolysin which dissolves the fibrin fibers so that the bacteria can spread all over the body. Sepsis, cellulitis, necrotizing fasciitis, erysipelas. Erysipelas literally means red skin. DNAs to break down your DNA. You can make antibodies against DNAs. We can measure these antibodies in your serum. The presence of tons of anti-DNA antibodies and ASO antibodies in your blood is a sign of streptococcus infection. What are the diseases caused by streptococcus pyogenes? Tons of them. We have suppurative diseases and non-suppurative diseases. Suppurative because it's called pyogenes. Pyo means pus and suppuration means pus. Pus in your throat, pharyngitis. Add rash to this problem. So now we have rash, fever, and pharyngitis. This is called scarlet fever. I had a classmate in my bacteriology class. Her name was Scarlett. You can't make this up. I mean, what's next? In my mycology class, I'll be introduced to Melisesia. Great name, by the way. Pyogenic skin diseases include impetigo, erysipelas, cellulitis, necrotizing fasciitis, and streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, toxemia, bacteremia, multi-organ failure, gangrene, death. Bacteremia can happen, peripotum sepsis can happen. This killed gazillion women throughout history. Group A beta hemolytic streptococcus is really nasty. But wait until we study inhalation and gastrointestinal anthrax. As for the non suppurative we have a problem in your heart, rheumatic fever, and a problem in your kidney, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. This one is not just heart, it's heart and joints and others. How can we diagnose streptococcus pyogenes? Microscopy and gram stain. You need culture. Enriched blood agar. Do not add high concentration of glucose because it will kill your streptococcus pyogenes. DNA amplification test. Identification by a biochemical test such as the test tube coagulase test. It will be negative without any clots because trapped is coagulase negative, but PYR positive. Basitracin sensitive, which means basitracin will kill it. And then detect the antigen or the antibody. We can detect your antibody against the bacterial antigen, such as your ASO antibody, your anti-DNA antibody, and your anti-M protein antibodies. Coming up next, Streptococcus agalactiae. Please pause and review. Streptococcus agalactiae, gram-positive cocci in short chains or long chains. If you want the long chains, you gotta culture them and wait until they reproduce and replicate. Streptococcus agalactiae causes three disasters in neonates. Neonatal sepsis, neonatal meningitis, and neonatal pneumonia. Is that it? Does it affect only neonates? No, it can affect adults as well. Also, peripartum sepsis. Virulence factors. Group-specific carbohydrate. We call it group B strep, so it has the B antigen, polysaccharide capsule, and surface proteins. This bacteria is usually transmitted from the mother to her neonate via vertical transmission. That's why we need to take a sample from mommy's genital area and rectal area, send it to the lab. If the lab told us that she has Streptococcus agalacti down there, we gotta give penicillin G to protect the neonate from neonatal sepsis, neonatal meningitis, and neonatal pneumonia. When should we take the sample from the mother? Between 35 and 37 weeks gestation. The treatment of choice is penicillin G before she gets infection, before the neonate gets the infection. What if she's allergic to penicillin? Give something else such as clindamycin or vancomycin. 
Coming up next, Streptococcus viridans. Virid from verd or vert, which means green because it's alpha hemolytic, partial hemolysis, and green color on blood agar. Here is Streptococcus viridans. Pause and review. Gram positive coccus, catalase negative, alpha hemolytic, green pigment, that's why we call it verd, Optoken resistant, bile resistant. When it comes to culture, viridens is very picky, i.e. fastidious. It wants a specific culture. I want complex media. I want blood products. I want carbon dioxide in 5% or 10%. Something in that range. I'm so picky. Otherwise, I will not show up. I will leave the chat. The viridens group of streptococci are gazillion bacteria, including streptangiosis, streptococcus mitis, streptococcus mutans, streptococcus salivarius, streptococcus bovis, and streptococcus suis. Don't forget the mighty heart, the endocarditis and bacteremia, mutants, think of my dentist who is freaking Frankenstein, and bovis causes bacteremia in patients who suffer from GI cancer or GI disease, including inflammatory bowel disease or liver disease, and the suis for CNS. How do we treat viridans? Penicillin. What if it's penicillin resistant? Cephalosporin or better, vancomycin. Pause and review. Coming up next, Streptococcus pneumoniae. And it's here. Gram-positive cocci arranged in pairs, diplococcus, or short chains. They are lancet-shaped, catalase-negative, alpha-hemolytic, because of their pneumolysin, glucose fermenter. New, fresh colonies are gram-positive, i.e. purple. But if these are old colonies that have been sitting on the petri dish for a while, they can appear pink, which means they did not retain the crystal violet stain well. Streptococcus pneumonia can form large colonies or small colonies. Could be alpha hemolytic or beta hemolytic. Most of the time it's alpha hemolytic under aerobic conditions. Virulence factors of Streptococcus pneumoniae are many. Focus on the capsule, which is polysaccharide. You can target the capsule in a vaccine. As for enzymes, there is the pneumolysin, there is amidase and IgA protease, which destroys your IgA. This bacteria is very sneaky. Diseases caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae could be seen here in the mnemonic MOPS, meningitis, otitis, media, pneumonia, and sinusitis. Bacteremia can happen as well, especially with meningitis or pneumonia. How can we diagnose streptococcus pneumonia? Microscopy with gram stain, quelling reaction, which literally means swelling reaction, because of the capsule, culture the bacteria, it will take a while. If you are in a hurry, do a DNA test, nucleic acid amplification test. For identification, we use biochemical tests. You can look at the carbohydrate group. You can look at uptoken sensitivity or bile sensitivity. Yes, it is sensitive to both. You can find the antigen, i.e. the capsule. How can we treat streptococcus pneumonia? Well, it depends, outpatient or inpatient. We talked about this before. Of course, if you open an internal medicine textbook, it is way more complicated than this. Just remember azithromycin, and please remember the respiratory quinolones, not ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin. Prophylaxis of streptococcus pneumonia, we have vaccines. We have the 23-valent and the 13-valent. The difference between the two was discussed in previous videos. Here is a cool mnemonic for streptococcus pneumoniae. Everything here is C. Oh, by the way, you know the C-reactive protein? Why did we call it C-reactive protein? Because of the C polysaccharide of pneumococcus. Coming up next, streptococcus bovis and enterococcus. Both can grow in bile, but only enterococcus can grow in salt. So enterococcus can grow in anything, in bile, in salt, in wide range of temperature and pH variations. Enterococcus can lead to GI and GU problems, urinary tract infections, endocarditis. They are inherently resistant to penicillin, such as oxacillin, nephicillin, and to cephalosporins. Moreover, some strains acquired 
further resistance against vancomycin, for example, and we call these vancomycin-resistant enterococci. Diseases caused by enterococci including problems in your gut and peritoneum, problems in the urinary tract, problems in your endocardium with valves, and bacteremia. Here is how you diagnose enterococcus. It's very easy. I'll leave you to read it. Just make sure to understand the difference between enterococcus and pneumococcus because they can look very similar under the microscope. How can we manage enterococcus? Cell wall synthesis inhibitor plus an aminoglycoside. Example is ampicillin plus gentamicin. If we have resistant organisms, we have newer options. Now let's talk about Streptococcus bovis. Grows in bile, but not in salt. The other name is Streptococcus gallolyticus because it causes hydrolysis of methyl gallate. Diseases, endocarditis, bacteremia, UTIs, biliary tract disease. Diagnosis, gram stain and culture. It is gamma hemolytic, coagulase negative, catalase negative. As you know, you can identify it by looking for the group D carbohydrate and you treat it with penicillin plus gentamicin because this is good old endocarditis. Here is a wonderful comparison between enterococcus and streptococcus bovis. And here are some rare, uncommon, gram-positive, catalase-negative cocci. Pause and review. I am grateful for Picmonic who allowed me to share these slides with you. Let's review Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Staphylococcus, here is a staph. Saprophyticus, here is sapphire. Gram positive, here is my angel. Coccus, cocked eyes. Catalase positive, here is my positive cat. Coagulase negative, negative clogs. Novobiosin resistant resistant to the bison. Urease positive, positive U eraser. What are the diseases? Urinary tract infections. Could be urethritis, cystitis, or pyelonephritis. Picmonic has more than 1,400 slides like this, and there is a video that you can watch. And a quiz for each one. And here is a wonderful comparison table. Please pause and review. And one more time, if you want to be a great student, bring a piece of paper and try to draw everything from memory. In the next videos in this Microbiology and Infectious Diseases playlist, we'll start talking about Bacillus anthracis and Bacillus cereus. Anthrax and food poisoning. If you like this video, you will adore my antibiotics course. It comes with 40 videos to teach you about penicillin, vancomycin, linizolid, clindamycin, etc. It also covers antifungals and antiviral medications. You can download it today at medicosisperfectionatus.com. I also have a surgery high yields course. Look at this Volkmann's contracture which is a complication of compartment syndrome. I also have an emergency medicine high yields course. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.